Hey everybody. This is uh, Sean and I'm about to do what is going to be the first of possibly many uh, patron portraits. And we're doing these for people who are in our $25 a month tier uh, to show our support or to show thanks for their support, but also to just, um, you know, have something else going on in the way that the Patreon interacts with the videos that we make and things like that. So this is um, going to be something that if you support us on Patreon at the $25 a month level, you will be eligible to be one of the people who will be selected every month. And basically, uh, somebody would get uh, one of these and uh, we'll just select from whatever people are in that tier. And so this particular month, this first month, there's only one person in the tier and uh, he selected this headshot and I'm going to do a quickie portrait. Uh, I'm not going to promise we're going to do them in a particular style, uh, but this one I'm going to do in a broad brush style and I might add a little bit of color afterwards. And uh, I do a lot of these. I, I do portraits for a weekly uh, business podcast, for instance, things like that. And those are really, really bold brush lines. And part of that is motivated by time, and part of it is just motivated by screen. People are going to see them in a variety of sizes, and I want something that can be read by different sizes. And take a look at these brushes I have here. Uh, two of these are synthetic sable, and one of them is um, legitimate sable. It doesn't really matter that much for my purposes here, though. This one has been unused, so I'm not going to use this one right now. And uh, this one is damaged, but usable. This will give me a nice dry brush line. For some of it. This one right here is now a split brush. You basically have no purpose for this other than trying to make two lines at the same time. It's split so badly. Um, when you're using brushes with India ink, India ink really does eat up the brush, and especially if you dip it in the ferrule, uh, so it actually touches the ferrule, then uh, your brushes will die a lot quicker. I actually keep my brushes segregated, brushes that are going to be used for color and brushes that are going to be used for India ink. And I generally, these days, only use synthetic sable for uh, my ink stuff. And uh, I'm using Dr. P.H. Martin's Black Star. Uh, they have two different varieties of Black Star. I've got a um, matte finish one here because I don't want it to be shiny. If I do add color to it, I don't want the, there to be a lot of gloss on there. And you'll notice that it's very easy for me to get a dry brush line right now, and that's not just because of the brush I'm using. It's also because I'm actually working on a, on a rougher watercolor paper. I don't think this is actually a rough designation. I think this is probably a hot press designation, which is rough, but not as rough. As another one. So I'm starting right here with um, lines since I'm not totally warmed up. <clears throat> I did a little bit of drawing yesterday and I did some drawing to get the pencil indications here. But um, I'm not really totally warmed up yet so I'm going to start with things that don't matter quite as much. When I say don't matter, I don't mean that this is an unimportant part of the image. But just like if I get a little bit off on somebody's glove or something, you're not going to notice it. Whereas if I'm off on the face, that's going to be a whole other thing to um, think about. And when I was penciling this, you notice real, I really have, you know, fairly tight penciling here. I was not planning on uh, getting in a lot of detail on the ink, and so you don't really need a lot of detail on the... Uh, in the pencil either. One of the things that I did do is uh, get some idea of where I want my middle tone values to be. And so some of the things that I've marked here are not things that I'm actually like this right here. I'm not going to make that a line, uh, but this is a middle tone value in the uh, photo. But I want to make sure that I communicate somehow. And very characteristic when you see shadows falling over someone's face those are part of the things that can really define the specificity of a face, uh, especially if it's important to get a likeness. You really want to make sure that you are paying attention 
to how the shadows are laid out. You might notice I'm having a little bit of difficulty talking while I'm doing this. Right, uh, some of it is just because obviously you're engaging part of your brain. Carson's got a lot of recent practice talking while he's drawing because he is currently an art instructor, but I haven't done this in a long time. I haven't taught high school art, for instance, which is what I used to do in 11 years, something like that. And I used to teach high school art. I would do demos all the time. And I got used to that. Uh, but the other reason that it's difficult sometimes to talk when you're uh, drawing is because, especially these big bold lines, it's really hard to uh, maintain the line if you're having to maintain your breath control at the same time. In other words, I breathe in relationship to the line making that I'm making. It doesn't mean that I'm always uh, holding my breath when I'm making the line but that the larger lines I might need to exhale while I'm doing them instead of inhaling, for instance. Now, one of the fun things about a uh, portrait is it presents a lot of different types of things and a little lot, brings opportunities for a lot of different types of strategies. So, for instance, on clothes and things like that, drapery, you can get a looseness of handling that would really be inappropriate for most portraits. In other words, like the face itself, you know, you have to be very controlled with your handling. But on the clothes and things like that, you can really kind of let go and try out a bunch of different stuff. And uh, as long as the face is in place in a good way, you don't really have to worry about it that much. In other words, you can really go nuts on certain parts of your image. I had a painting teacher that told me if you really want to see how the great portrait artists of other eras could paint, like what their real skills were, you shouldn't look at the faces, you should look at their ears. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, there's probably a couple different reasons for that, but one of the reasons for that is because the Especially in an era where portraiture, you know, was intended to give you an idea of what somebody looked like. It wasn't just like, you know, it was not just like a vanity thing, but like an actual identifier. Uh, people had a tendency to really overwork faces. You know, you, you really, really work them until that they don't, they have a real sheen to them and don't have any sort of surface texture or, you know, things like that. Whereas, when they're getting to something like the ear, you know, a lot of painter or painters could really let go, and uh, you would see a lot of a different kind of handling to it. Similar to uh, clothes, you look at somebody like you know Velasquez or somebody like that who his faces look very very controlled, but then when you see uh, what he's done with like a gown or something like that, I mean, it's almost you know, it's almost impressionistic, or it can be anyway. So, because I don't know for sure whether I'm going to put uh, color in here, I think I'm going to do a little bit of color, but I don't know for sure. I don't know. I might run out of time here, or I might decide that it doesn't need it. But uh, because I don't know for sure, I'm actually not going to... Um, I'm not going to do any, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do the ink first, whereas uh, a lot of times that might not be the case, that might not be my approach for a mixed media piece, especially if you have a lot of dramatic blacks, and especially if you're going to use like a watercolor where the, um, the pigments are not always transparent, or oftentimes not transparent then uh, doing the blacks last, you can, you can get a richer look to the black. Things like that. So, as I'm warming up here, I'm creeping in towards the face and towards these defining 
characteristics. I'm going to leave the, uh, whatever this ear piece thing is in the picture, but oftentimes when I'm doing something like this, I'll take out, you know, little technological things or things like that. And just on the supposition that those things change over time, and the particular earpiece that somebody has in is going to look different 10 years from now or whatever. So I have a tendency to leave that kind of stuff out if I'm looking for a certain kind of classic look. I went to a watercolor exhibit before, and uh, I saw a portrait of what the watercolor is probably thought of as a, you know, blues singer really feeling it or something like that. It was obviously referenced from a photo, uh, presumably that the watercolors had taken, and they had an electronic tuner on the guitar. And, uh, you know, I don't know if the watercolors didn't know what it was or didn't care or didn't think about it, but uh, it, was, it almost looked like an anachronism, even though, you know, there's nothing else in the photo that would indicate what time the picture might have been from and the watercolor to look itself to me anyway looked like it was uh you know a different era but having that electronic tuner in there on the head of the guitar really spoiled the effect for me but in this case i don't mind i think it's just fine so one of the things I'm wondering about here is the transparency of the of the sunglasses. I'm actually going to build this up here instead of just doing the solid black. I'm going to build up the eye a little bit uh, because I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to handle this. And uh, the nice thing about solid black is you can always just pop it right on top if uh, you want to. I might consider doing some type of dry brush look for that. Noses are one of those areas where artists have a tendency to flatten and uh, to work in their ideas of what a nose looks like instead of really looking at what they've got there. So really a critical area and an area where there's a huge amount of diversity in terms of construction. I mean, you can break somebody out into type, but uh, they're, they're really... It's a very, very distinctive thing, and not all sort of shorthand depictions of a nose will stand up to every different type you might have. Now, faces are fairly interesting with ink. I feel like you run a risk of aging somebody as you're working, especially if you know it's intended to be a portrait of them of a person, you know, that they love, or themselves, or whatever, there's a certain amount of flattery that goes on with the depiction. I don't know if I'm really worried about that in this case. Uh, but, um, you, you sort of learn, especially if you do portraits live, which I've done a lot, uh, you know, where the person's actually sitting there, or someone that they know is sitting there watching you do it, you sort of learn over time that certain kinds of things can be de-emphasized or emphasized with very, very minute changes, especially like the expression of the mouth and um, how you depict the corners of the mouth, especially you can give somebody just a little bit of lift to that corner, and that can be the difference between a modestly smiling face and a stone-cold, uh, I'm going to kill you face. Just a little bit of lift to the corner of the mouth. Uh, in this case, it's complicated by the presence of a mustache. But you can still kind of fake it. You can still, you know, give it a little, a little edge to the corner to give it a little look of uplift. Uh, in this case, I was just saying that um, I was going to, you know, you, you want to be cautious with the lines, furrows, and things like that. Because uh, ink is so bold that you really do risk, you know, aging somebody pretty quickly by popping a bunch of lines on there. In this case, 
I've been fairly modest with my lines so far, and I think I'm doing okay. But once you've worked a certain value in there, it's hard to avoid other values of a similar nature. So having put this line in there, I think this one was suddenly necessary. And uh, I'm going to kind of scrub this a little bit to get a, a little bit of a dry brush effect in here and see if I can get some of the expression that he has underneath his glasses. Which is really nice. One of the things that I like about this photo, so I want to lose that, so I'm going to scrub in there a little bit. I'm feeling bold enough, I think, that I can go for the line of the head now. Now, if this was in color, I wouldn't do the line of the head, most likely. I wouldn't do a line at all in this area. Um, but because this is a ink portrait, and the way I've set up my value relationship so far, I'm going to go ahead and do lines. And uh, with watercolors, you know, traditional watercolor doesn't have a lot of black ink. <laughs> um, kind of anathema to the sort of traditional process, but um, I find it can make a really graphic, uh, appealing graphic approach to use it. So sometimes do and I sometimes don't. I went through a long period where I didn't do any um, black at all with watercolor. Uh, but uh, now I've kind of made peace with it again. This is actually getting pretty good now, and what I'm going to start looking for now is my overall line weight issues. It seems like the the weights are not totally consistent right now, but uh, one of the reasons for that might be because I don't have my intended blacks in. If you look, um, basically I want this hood, that shadow underneath the hood, to be black. One of the reasons for that is because, you know, it's dark there. The other reason for that is because it'll push behind the head and make the hood distinct visually. So I'm actually not getting a super solid black right now because of this paper. But, um, there we go. Oh, look at that. Tasty. All of a sudden, we get some pop. Quite dramatic. And I kind of like the backstroke look. I've got to some of those white areas. I might actually keep those there. Scrub a little bit. This feels a little off to me. There we go. I need to de-emphasize the sort of shape of it. It's just not quite. It needs to be a little bit more random. You'll find if you draw everything exactly as it appears in a photo, you oftentimes get spots like that where it reads fine when your brain is seeing it photographically, but look at it graphically, it looks incorrect. Something about it is not right. Now this really needs to be bolder handily. Now same with this right here. I want to make sure that it, this feels like the same edge that they're kind of continuing over that I'm sort of giving the outside of the body. There we go. It's a little better. Same thing right here. This, oh, this shadow should kind of cut in. And then I'm going to look around and see if there any detail to the coat that I haven't put in that might also help things out. Okay, well, I've got to make a choice here because um, I've got this uh, black glove, which obviously doesn't read black visually in the photo. And I've also got this area right here, which is darker. Let's set it back. I think I'm actually going to use solid black behind the glove. Like this. And then maybe
dry brush the glove. So, problem with dry brushing it at this moment is that my brush is not going to dry brush at the moment. So I actually have to use a little bit more of my charge before I can do any effective dry brushing. And that might do it here. Okay, let's just try a little bit. So rather than fill in with the dry brush right now, I'm just going to try to indicate the darkest areas of the glove with the dry brush. And now I can kind of scrub out a little bit as it's scrubbed in an outward direction from the... If this was a pen and ink or something where I was looking for a bolder, or not bolder, um, more finicky handling, I might actually do this with uh, cross hatching or something to indicate that texture. Uh, but then, of course, I might have the need to do some competing texture somewhere else so that the glove didn't become too dominant. Okay, so now in this case, I can think I can bring the scrubbing across the eye. I think I need to define the glasses frame a little bit now. It's actually pretty good right now. Got this little dimple. Yeah, that's actually key to the expression right here. I think I'm gonna now I've got this soft. Now that I've got the soft uh, dry brush here, I'm going to fill in the shadow a little bit there. I'm kind of tempted to do this shadow here, but I think I'm going to leave that alone. Now, if you were working for reproduction and you didn't know how to use sharpening, uh, you might be worried about this scrubbing. Uh, that I'm doing right here. If you were thinking about this as being reproduced as a one-bit, you know, line art image or something like that, but uh, I have no such worries about that because, uh, well, a, I don't know if I'm actually going to reproduce it, but b, because uh, the texture of the paper is such that you get a good scan and you're at a good size and, um, and a good resolution, and you sharpen it, I'm going to be able to get that happening no problem. So you can actually reproduce all of these things without half-toning your image. All right. So this is closer to a painted surface than you might imagine for a typical ink drawing. I kind of like it as it is. But, uh... Oh, what the heck, I might do a wash. I haven't used anything other than the first brush that I started with. I've kind of kind of mental timer going here that I know that I need to wash this out fairly quickly. I don't have water with me right now as I'm working. Uh, which means that uh, my my brush is going to be toast if I leave leave the ink to dry in there. And of course, the fact that um, I keep on re-dipping it is actually the reason I can go this long. Because the um, as long as you haven't dipped the ferrule, the metal part in there, re recharging the brush with more ink is actually preserving it and keeping it from drying out. problem with keeping water with you while you ink, uh, and obviously you want to do that if you're having a long inking session or something like that, or if you're going to stop and start or switch tools. Uh, the problem with keeping water with you when you ink is that the water, especially if you're using you know watercolor paper like this, can uh, mess up your line and make it too watery, accidentally give you something that's not going to 
you know, reproduce very well. Especially it's going to start filling in these holes. The whole point of working on paper like this is to have the texture as the brush skids across the surface. Alright. I think we're going to call this good. I certainly am uh, happy with it right now. I might try a uh, single value wash on there after the fact. And um, if I do try it, I'll post it as another video. And if I if I don't try it, um, it's because I was too afraid. No, just kidding. You gotta do a lot of these, by the way, before you uh, start hitting them at this speed. Um, I don't know how many podcast guest portraits I've done at this point, but uh, an awful lot. Yeah, I don't know. I might still need to work the glasses just a little bit darker in here. I like the brow popping up. There's something about this is very appealing. There we go. These kinds of upward lines where we're seeing through. I always liked the abstraction of the glasses as well. You get these kind of reflections that are very interesting on there. something on top of the coat here. I really like that big triangle line I just got right there. I feel like I'm going to blob out a few more of those before I go. I'm sort of unfocusing my eyes a little bit and looking at the value relationships. And this right here. Scrub out a little of that value. Alright, I'm going to call it good. So this was all done with a Da Vinci Maestro, Kalinsky 10, and um, yeah, uh, for the, synth the really good synthetic uh, sables for ink drawing to me are basically the same as a real sable. Uh, not the case with watercolor, but watercolor you have a different kind of handling and a different feel to how things are coming off the brush. Uh, but at this point, you know, I, I don't have enough money to... Uh, use the synthetic with the amount of turnover I have on brushes, but, uh, all right. Hope you enjoy. If you, uh, liked this and, uh, you want to support more videos like this, or, uh, you know, you want to get a portrait for yourself, I'm always open to commissions and things like that, but also, uh, you can just be a patron, uh, for us at the $25 level, and, um, if next month there's only one person, a uh, new person at that level, then that person will definitely get a portrait. Uh, and if there's five, then, uh, you know, I will randomly select one of those people uh, to do and we'll keep on going every month until everybody in that category has gotten a portrait uh, from a photo of your choice. Um, although I prefer, prefer to get a few options if possible. Uh, and uh, hope you've enjoyed watching. Thanks so much.